Lord Jesus, thank you for loving us. Coming to earth, taking on our sin, enduring the cross, bearing our sin away as far as the east is from the west, making us able to stand in grace and one day to stand in glory. Oh Lord, we tremble this morning at the thought of your grace given to sinners. We approach with trepidation the lofty heights of your mercies. And we come with hearts eager to revel not in our achievements, not in our wisdom, not in our knowledge, but in yours and yours alone, in your gracious plan to redeem, in your righteous right to judge, and your mercy dispensed to us in the gospel. We thank you for these things. Help us this morning to understand with greater clarity your greatness and your grace And we ask it in Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. I invite you to turn in your Bibles this morning to Romans. And we have been climbing. We've been climbing a mountain. We've been climbing the mountain of God's sovereign mercy. And we are about to summit here at the end of Romans chapter 11. It was January 15th, 2017, that Scott Maxwell brought us to base camp and began our journey up this mountain, the sovereign mercy of God towering high above us. And step by step by step, we have made our way here to this monumental climactic peak in Romans 11, two years, 10 months later. I want to rehearse some of the steps that we've taken. Think back to Romans chapter 1 and the very theme of this book. Paul says, I am not ashamed of the gospel. Why is Paul not ashamed of the gospel? Because in it, the righteousness of God is manifested. Why do we need the righteousness of God manifested in the gospel? Because the wrath of God is being revealed against all the godlessness and wickedness of men who suppress the truth and unrighteousness. We sinners need the gospel. Paul's not ashamed to write and to proclaim and to take the gospel to the ends of the earth because it is the only hope for sinful mankind. That is the theme of this letter. And you remember in chapter 1 that the indictment of God against the Gentiles is severe. Gentiles are sinners, hopeless, helpless, under the judgment of God, ready only for his wrath. In chapter 2, we discover that the Jews are under the same indictment. They are under the indictment of God as sinners. And in chapter 3, in case it wasn't clear that Gentiles are sinners and Jews are sinners, in case there's any thought there could be any other category, Romans 3 is clear that everyone is a sinner. It is written, there is none righteous, not even one. There is no one who understands. There is no one who seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become useless. There is no one who does good, not even one. Their throats are open graves. Their tongues practice deceit. The poison of vipers is under their lips. Their mouths are full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Ruin and misery mark their ways, and the way of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. In Romans 3.19, Paul sums up that indictment against the totality and universality of human depravity by saying this, that we know that whatever God's law says, it speaks to those who are under the law so that every mouth may be silenced and the whole world held accountable to God. In addition to that, verse 20 says, by works of the law, no man will be justified. No man could ever be declared righteous on the basis of keeping law. The law just shut all our mouths. 
were locked up, closed up, closed off as sinners by nature and by activity. And none of our activities and nothing from our nature could ever remedy that situation. But now, Romans 3.21, apart from law, the righteousness of God has been made known. The righteousness that God alone possesses intrinsically and the righteousness that you and I must possess if there is to be any, be any hope of our standing in his presence without being utterly destroyed. That righteousness has been made known apart from law. And listen, the law pointed to it, the prophets pointed to it. This is the righteousness of God that comes through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. No distinction, Jew, Gentile. Why? Because all fall sin, all, all sin and fall short of the glory of God and are justified as a gift by his grace through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus. This work is all of God from beginning to end, and God displayed Jesus publicly as a propitiation in his blood through faith. That is, God set up his beloved son, the beautiful, the excellent, the holy second person in the Trinity, as a substitute sacrifice to do away with divine wrath, to fully absorb divine wrath against sin in himself. That is a propitiation a substitution that satisfies wrath. And God did that one with his son for all those who receive him in faith so that God could be just and the justifier. He gets to maintain his reputation as righteous and he gets to declare righteous people like us. Romans 4, 5 says, it is not those who work who get this status as righteous but those who believe God are counted righteous. The ungodly counted righteous. This is the gospel. This is the mountain of the mercy of God we've been climbing. And in chapter 4, we discover Abraham as the example of one who believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. This is justification by faith alone. And in chapter 5, we see the fruits of that justification, beginning with peace with God. We were enemies, and God has made peace on the basis of our declaration of righteousness. We have a standing in grace. We possess enduring perseverance and proven character and the hope of glory. We have the personal and inexhaustible love of God welling up in us, and we have union with Christ and the reign of grace. All of these are fruits and results of God's justifying work in the gospel. And chapter 6 details our new relationship to sin. We're no longer under that old slave master. You are not a slave to sin because you have died and been united with Christ all by God's grace. You are under the reign of grace and no longer under the tyranny of sin. And in chapter 7, we're no longer under the tyranny of law, which could only serve to tell us what the rules are, show us how we violate them, entice us to violate them further, and then condemn us for having violated them. And that is the good law of God the good law of God was never designed to save. Only the gospel can save. And union with Christ creates for you, yes, a new relationship to sin in chapter 6, and also a new relationship to law in chapter 7. And in chapter 8, we see a new relationship to God by the Holy Spirit. What God has produced for us by His grace and through His Spirit is a, a new mindset, a spiritual one, and a new status. We are adopted brought into God's family by his undeserved kindness and new power, the Holy Spirit residing in us, leading us to kill sin, interceding on our behalf in prayer. And so in chapter 8, we are uncondemnable, unseparatable, overwhelmingly conquerors because of God's grace in uniting us to Christ through faith. And in chapters 9 to 11, we have discovered that God's mercy in the gospel, is reliable. Everything in chapters 1 to 8, we can bank on because God's word is good. His promises are good. His grace is irrevocable. His word is solid and bankable. Romans 9 to 11 are proof that God keeps his word. Specifically, promises are not in jeopardy over Israel's rejection of Messiah. 
And if you and I were Christians in the first century, we'd be tempted to think, wait, God made promises to Israel. Israel doesn't seem to be embracing the Messiah that came from her and for her. Are God's promises to Israel null and void? And if God's promises to Israel are null and void, then what good are his promises to me? And Paul has assured us that as we approach the summit of this mountain of mercy, that God's word is reliable. Paul has been laboring this point. And, and in the process of laboring the point that God's word is reliable, we have been humbled by the magnitude of God's mercy, realizing again and again and again that we do not deserve to be recipients of his love. We do not deserve to be inheritors of glory. We do not deserve mercy we discover all over again that our own sins had locked us up in disobedience and rebellion. We were helpless and hopeless in a dungeon of depravity from which we could not extricate ourselves. And if not for a skilled and sovereign potter, Romans chapter 9, graciously working with stubbornly rebellious clay, we would all be forever lost, left to destruction and eternal misery but God, Romans 9, 23, was making his riches known to vessels of mercy, preparing us for glory. And we Gentiles were made to feel small again by the towering massive of God's undeserving mercy to us outsiders. Romans 9, 30, we did not pursue righteousness, but we obtained it. While Israel, pursuing a righteousness by merit, missed it. God's mercy in the gospel humbled us again in chapter 10. In verses 6 through 10, we discovered that to come to Christ through faith in the gospel is to abandon self-rule and to abandon self-justification. You come to Jesus as Lord. That is, he's sovereign over everything, and he gets to be sovereign over my heart. And that's a good thing. To, to give up, to surrender to Jesus, the one who truly has my best interest over and against what I could ever muster. And to come to the gospel meant an abandonment of self-justification. That is, you couldn't go to heaven and bring Messiah down. You couldn't go solve your own sin problem. And you couldn't go down to the grave and bring him up. You couldn't bring about the, the, the death, burial, resurrection, ascension, and intercession of Christ. Only God can solve our problem. So to abandon everything in self, self-rule, and any attempts at self-justification and human religion only magnifies God's mercy in the gospel. We, we surrender our lives in simple faith in what God accomplishes apart from me, outside of me, in spite of me. And we're humbled again by the awareness that the great privilege of faith in Messiah was missed by the very nation for whom and from whom Messiah came. Now, those who have climbed Mount Everest, any of you in this room who have done that, you know that the last 3,000 feet, 26,000 to 29,000 feet, is a slow climb, a slow, methodical, disciplined climb when your brain stops working and your body screams, I don't want to work anymore. Because above 26,000 feet, your body cannot process oxygen any longer. It cannot acclimatize to the altitude. And cells begin to die in rapid fashion. And the longer you stay above 26,000 feet, the more cells die. Every moment spent above that level means you die a little more. But every moment spent above that level offers a rare glimpse that few have seen. And here, frail humans understand their smallness. As we approach the summit of the mountain of God's sovereign mercy, we have tread slowly, methodically, walking in thin air. These last three chapters of this ascent have allowed us rare glimpses into the high atmosphere of God's dealings with sinful humanity. Listen, we have no right or deserving to be saved, and we certainly don't have the right to understand the mechanisms in the mysteries of God behind our being saved. But God has given us these glimpses to humble us again. We discover our smallness in the looming presence of God's purpose and his plan. 
realizing that my salvation is not really just all about my salvation. (laughs) There is something bigger going on here. And what benefits me infinitely in ways I will never be able to measure. Things that will bring me infinite and ever-increasing happiness for all of eternity are about something much bigger than me. We discover a great big God is putting his glory on display by being merciful to me, the sinner. My creator, my sovereign The one infinitely offended by my crimes against him has chosen to set his affections on me in love and grace and kindness and mercy. And he does so to put his own infinite goodness on display. So to relive the last few steps of our climb, I want to read chapter 11 in its entirety. And we will stand on the summit together this morning by focusing our attention on the last seven verses Follow along as I read Romans 11. I say then, God has not rejected his people, has he? May it never be, for I too am an Israelite, a descendant of Abraham, of the tribe of Benjamin. God has not rejected his people whom he foreknew. Or do you not know what the scripture says in the passage about Elijah, how he pleads with God against Israel? Lord, They have killed your prophets, they have torn down your altars, and I alone am left, and they are seeking my life. But what is the divine response to him? I have kept for myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to Baal. In the same way then, there has also come to be at the present time a remnant according to God's gracious choice. But if it is by grace, it is no longer on the basis of works, otherwise grace is no longer grace. What then? What Israel is seeking, it is not obtained, but those who were chosen obtained it, and the rest were hardened. Just as it is written, God gave them a spirit of stupor, eyes to see not and ears to hear not, down to this very day. And David says, let their table become a snare and a trap and a stumbling block and a retribution to them. Let their eyes be darkened to see not and bend their backs forever. I say then, They did not stumble so as to fall, did they? May it never be. But by their transgression, salvation has come to the Gentiles to make them jealous. Now, if their transgression is riches for the world and their failure is riches for the Gentiles, how much more will their fulfillment be? But I am speaking to you who are Gentiles. Inasmuch then as I am an apostle of Gentiles, I magnify my ministry if somehow I might move to jealousy my fellow countrymen and save some of them. For if their rejection is the reconciliation of the world, what will their acceptance be but life from the dead? If the first piece of dough is holy, the lump is also. If the root is holy, the branches are too. But if some of the branches were broken off, and you, being a wild olive, were grafted in among them and became partaker with them of the rich root of the olive tree, do not be arrogant toward the branches. But if you are arrogant, remember that it is not you who supports the root, but the root supports you. You will say then, branches were broken off so that I might be grafted in. Quite right, they were broken off for their unbelief. But you stand by your faith. Do not be conceited, but fear. For if God did not spare the natural branches, he will not spare you either. Behold then the kindness and severity of God. To those who fell, severity. But to you, God's kindness, if you continue in his kindness, otherwise you also will be cut off. And they also, if they do not continue in their unbelief, will be grafted in. For God is able to graft them in again. For if you were cut off from what is by nature a wild olive tree and were grafted contrary to nature into a cultivated olive tree, how much more will those who are the natural branches be grafted into their own olive tree? For I do not want you to be unaware, brethren, uninformed of this mystery, so that you will not be wise in your own estimation that a partial hardening has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. And so all Israel will be saved. Just as it is written, the deliverer will come from Zion. He will remove ungodliness from Jacob. This is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. 
From the standpoint of the gospel, they are enemies for your sake. But from the standpoint of God's choice, they are beloved for the sake of the fathers. For the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. For just as you once were disobedient to God, but now have been shown mercy because of their disobedience, so these also now have been disobedient, that because of the mercy shown to you, they also may now be shown mercy. For God has shut up all in disobedience, so that he may show mercy to all. Oh, the depth of the riches and the wisdom and the knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and unfathomable his ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord? Or who has become his counselor? Or who has first given to him that it might be paid back to him again? For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. What do we discover at the summit Sovereign mercy? What conclusion are we to come to after 11 chapters of explanation of the gospel and the way that God is working out that gospel in redemptive history? First of all, we discover that no one deserves to be saved. No one deserves to be saved. Look at verse 30 to 32. Just as you Gentiles were disobedient to God but now have been shown mercy because of their, Israel's disobedience. So these also now have been disobedient, that because of the mercy shown to you Gentiles, they also may now be shown mercy. For God has shut up all in disobedience, so that he may show mercy to all. What we find in these three verses is the intentional display of mercy by God. God intends to show the way he saves sinners to magnify things that are intrinsic in his own character and his own attributes, particularly his mercy. And remember, this part of Paul's argument began in 9.6a. Has the word of God failed? And it concludes here in 11.29, the gifts and calling of God are irrevocable. No, the word of God hasn't failed. It cannot fail. And and how can Paul say that? Verses 30 and 31 are Paul's explanation of of the summary of the argument in Romans 9 to 11. How can Paul say the word of God has not failed? Well, precisely because the Jew-Gentile Jew sandwich of salvation was the plan. This was God's plan. Verses 30 and 31 summarize all that Paul has articulated in Romans 11. Israel rejects the gospel. The gospel goes to Gentiles, the outsiders. Israel, moved by the outsiders to jealousy, will one day believe en masse. And of course, there is the three-part answer to the question that Paul raised in Romans 9, 6. Has the word of God failed? No. And there's three reasons. Number one, not all Israel is Israel. Remember that a believing Jew is a subset of ethnic Israel, and there are believing Jews. In other words, you're not in God's favor simply because you have Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob as your great-grandfathers. But you must actually believe. You must be born again if you are a spiritual Jew. And the second answer to the question is God is faithful to keep a remnant. He has always kept a remnant by election, by grace, by his sovereign mercy. And the third answer is the end of Romans 11 and verse 26, that God has promised a national salvation for Israel yet to come. Those three answers, any one of which would have been enough to satisfy the question, has has God's word failed? No, God is sovereign and keeps his promises. But the specific promises of the Old Testament to Israel will be met in a national, ethnic repentance yet to come. And it is the final, culminating, dramatic answer to the question, has God's word failed? Jewish rejection, Gentile inclusion, and then a Jewish national repentance were all part of the plan. It was always the plan. Now, verse 32 answers a question we might be asking, why was a Jew-Gentile Jew sandwich the plan? Why did God do it that way? And verse 32 is the explanation. Notice the four at the beginning. This is explanatory. For God has shut up all in disobedience. That is, everybody with no distinctions, Jew-Gentile alike, 
so that he may show mercy to all. Again, not all without exception. Not every human being receives this mercy. But all without distinction receive this mercy. The reason the Jew-Gentile Jew sandwich is God's plan for redemption of humanity is because this salvation sandwich puts all of humanity on the same level. It puts us all at the bottom of that deep well of human depravity that Scott depicted for us in Romans chapter 5. We all have a solidarity with Adam, the first man, in our depravity and rebellion against God. And we can't get ourselves out of there, and we're all together in it, Jew and Gentile alike. Nobody has special privilege because of their social status or their heredity or anything they have done to get themselves out of that hole, that deep dungeon. Only God's mercy pulls sinners out. The only solution to sinful man's helpless plight is the gospel. God's mercy mentioned over and over and over again in these last three chapters Mercy is simply a compassionate response to someone in a pitiable state. Someone that doesn't deserve rescuing. Someone who actually deserves punishment and God relents on the punishment. Some have described mercy as not getting what you do deserve. And God has looked at us sinners with compassion, kindness, pity, mercy. Gentile nations were outsiders to the covenant promises made to Israel. You remember Rahab the harlot and Ruth the Moabitess and Naaman the leper and the Syrophoenician woman and a Roman centurion, these Gentiles who felt like outsiders, who wanted like dogs crumbs from the master's table. Can I just have a little bit of your mercy? I don't deserve it, and I know I don't deserve it. Mercy is my only hope, and God grants mercy to Gentiles. And perhaps you and I don't feel like the Roman centurion or Ruth the Moabitess or the Syrophoenician woman because we've grown accustomed to Gentile ecclesiology. We don't feel the immense privilege it has been to have been outsiders brought into God's family. Maybe you can think about your own salvation and think about what it was like just before you knew Christ those moments when you discovered that you were in peril and you were in need and you asked the question, could God receive me? And you cried out in faith to the Lord Jesus Christ and he saved. And you went from outsider to insider. You went from lost to saved. You went from under the dominion of Satan and darkness into the kingdom of his glorious light. You were made instantly a citizen of heaven and you were granted privileges of the highest order adopted into God's family. Do you remember it? To be a Gentile in, to be any sinner and be brought in is such unbelievable privilege. And God saves in this way so that Gentiles who knew they didn't belong, who knew they did not deserve a share in the kindness of the God of Israel, such that when God opened the floodgates of salvation to the Gentile world in the first century, Gentiles believed And all over the globe, Gentiles have believed. People from distant nations read a Jewish book about a Jewish Messiah who purchased with his blood persons from every tongue and tribe and nation and people. On the other hand, Israel, as a national identity, has believed that she deserved God's favor. Listen to the... Jewish leaders' words to Jesus himself in John 8, 39. Oh, we of Abraham is our father. Do you hear the entitlement in that? I'm not a slave. I'm not a child of Satan, which is what Jesus calls them later in the chapter. Abraham's our father. We have by heredity all that God needs to dispense his favor upon us. Matthew 3, 9, John the Baptist's preaching, he said, Do not suppose that you can say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father. For I say to you that from these stones God is able to raise up children to Abraham. The axe is already laid at the root of the trees. Therefore, every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Descendants of Abraham cut off, cut down for unbelief.
this heart of entitlement is expressed in the Pharisee in Luke 18, who stood and was praying this to himself, God, I thank you that I'm not like other people, swindlers, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I pay tithes of all I get. What does God's plan of salvation in a Jew-Gentile-Jew sandwich do to Jewish entitlement? It brings it to an end so that Jews who believe now feel like outsiders who need to get in. They're cut off for unbelief, and their only hope is the mercy of God, not their merits, not their heredity, but only His mercy bound up in His irrevocable promise. And what is Israel's hope for a national repentance? It is Zechariah 12.10. It is the pouring out by God of the spirit of grace and supplication on the house of David, on the inhabitants of Jerusalem, so that they will look on Yahweh, whom they pierced, and mourn for him as one mourns for an only son, and they will weep bitterly over him like the bitter weeping over a firstborn. Listen, in that day, no Jew will say, hey, I belong here. Look at my lineage. Or, I belong here. Look what I've done. They will only say, what am I doing here? I was cut off for unbelief, and God in his mercy crafted me in. How can this be? And they will echo what Gentiles should have been saying. What do we discover at the summit of God's sovereign mercy? No one deserves to be here. Why has God executed his plan this way? So that the refrain of heaven is, I do not belong here. And yet God has made me to belong here by his mercy only by his grace. God has orchestrated salvation history so that no one can lay claim on God, so that God is not indebted to anyone, so that no one is entitled to God's favor. Everyone in heaven will say, how did I get here? And the answer, the only conceivable answer, is the glorious, sovereign mercy of God. And this leads us to the second discovery we make at the summit of God's sovereign mercy. God alone gets the glory. God gets the glory. God gets all of the glory. Verses 33 to 36. Paul bursts out in song. Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and the knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and unfathomable his ways. Who has known the mind of the Lord? Who became his counselor? Who first gave to God that it might be paid back to him for from him and through him and to him are all things to him be the glory forever. Now, there's no chord chart given with these last four verses. There's no melody provided. No instrumentation is indicated. But there is rhythmic symmetry. There is poetic parallelism. There is deeply illustrative language. And the O at the beginning of verse 33 indicates that the Apostle Paul is bursting forth at a summit of praise as he stands on the peak of sovereign mercy exploring the depths of what God has done for sinners. This is called a doxology, doxa, glory, logos, meaning a word, ology, or the study of something. This is a word about glory, an investigation of glory. This is Paul's outburst of his praise over the glory of God. And and there are a number of these doxologies in Scripture. Uh, An outburst of praise in response to rapturous truth where the human writer of Scripture is caught up and overwhelmed by the glories of God's revelation in His Word and carried along by the Holy Spirit, pens these emotional responses to truth, and the doxologies themselves carry truth. We saw one earlier in in Romans, this little interruption when Paul is describing the, the dishonor 
of what it means that sinful, rebellious men exchange the glory of God for earthly, created, temporal things. In verse 25, he says, they exchange the truth of God for a lie and worshiped and served the creator rather than the creator. Worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator. And Paul can't help but say, who is forever praised, amen. And you get these interjections of praise at the truths of who God is and what he has done. And we have that here in the last four verses of Romans 11. Notice, oh, the depth. And depth here modifies riches and wisdom and knowledge. Now, the the original text reads uh, literally the depth of the riches and the wisdom and the knowledge of God. The depth of God's riches, the depth of God's wisdom, and the depth of God's knowledge. The deepest known point in the world's oceans is called Challenger Deep. Is it a small segment of the Mariana Trench off off the coast of Guam, an island in the Pacific? It is nearly seven miles deep. It's deeper than Mount Everest is tall. And men have been there in very complicated machines that allow them to survive it. At those depths, every square inch of space encounters 15,000 pounds of pressure. There's a crushing depth. And yet the bottom of the Mariana Trench is right on the surface edge of the earth. If the Mariana Trench is nearly seven miles deep, the center of the earth is another 4,000 miles Just to to get a sense of of what it means to go deep into something, you you and I just don't. And and here Paul describes the depth of the riches of God, which far exceeds 4,000 miles to the center of the earth. We're talking infinite proportions of of depth. And notice what's described here as being deep, God's riches, God's wisdom, and God's knowledge. God's riches, I believe, are what's described in chapter 11, verse 12, the the riches of salvation. This is God's innate desire to give of himself, to, to dispense with his infinite resources to people who don't deserve it. We are impoverished, but God is infinitely rich, and he gives, and he gives, and he gives through the riches of salvation in the gospel. He's giving of himself, And the depth is described further as the depth of wisdom. This is God's perfect implementation of the information at his disposal. And you ask, well, how much information is that? Well, then Paul talks about the depth of his knowledge. God has exact cognition of everything. Everything that ever was, everything that currently is, everything that will be, everything that could have been, every contingency, every hypothetical, God knows in infinite detail. And the depths of the riches and the wisdom and the knowledge of God, again, make us small. A God who has infinite and perfect knowledge, who implements that knowledge in the best possible way, combined with the desire to give himself to his creatures as an infinitely abounding treasure, is a good one to know. He is a good one to know by his grace, to be invited into relationship, to be adopted into his family, to belong to him, to say, he is my God, and for him to say, they are my people. What unbelievable privilege. It's one thing to have information. It's another thing entirely to use it well, but it is altogether unbelievable that the God of the universe seeks to be known and enjoyed by his creatures, that he longs to give and give and give of himself to us so that we might benefit from his riches. It's no wonder that Paul calls this deep, and he starts his outburst of praise with the exclamation, oh. And he goes on in verse 33, after telling us what God is like, he is omniscient, he's all-wise and infinitely generous. He then responds to the outworking of his character on the stage of redemptive history. How unsearchable, Paul says, are his judgments, and unfathomable his ways. These are two overlapping and synonymous descriptions of God's activities in the world. 
his judgments, that is his executive decisions. These are his decrees or what he has decided to do. And his ways are the manner in which he carries those decisions out. God's decisions and his carrying out those decisions are inscrutable. They're beyond being able to trace out. They're unsearchable and unfathomable. And these two words in verse 33, unsearchable and unfathomable, are, are synonyms. They, they come, the first comes from a root word meaning to track an animal. And the second comes from a word re- regarding an animal's footprint. And the idea is tracing out the tracks of something and and you can't quite get the trail. You you can't figure it out. You can't trace it out. You can't track it. All hopes of finding this animal have been abandoned because the trail is too hard to detect. The idea here is that God's ways are not our ways. We do not naturally think the way God thinks. And this should come as no surprise. Contrast our poverty, our foolishness, and our ignorance with the riches, the wisdom, and the knowledge of God. What God decides to do and how he decides to do it flow out of his infinite character. He does as he is. He is infinitely knowledgeable, infinitely wise, and infinitely generous, and he acts in accordance with his being. We, comparatively, are ignorant, foolish, and poor Of course we don't get what God is up to. We would never dream up up God's schemes. We would never think of the things that he has done, nor the ways in which he has done them. God's riches, his knowledge, and his wisdom are deep, incalculably deep. Ours, a rain gutter, a saucer, a thimble with water in it. Paul then in verse 34 and 35 asks three rhetorical questions to demonstrate the contrast. Our poverty, our folly, our ignorance in comparison to God's infinitely deep riches, wisdom, and knowledge. These three questions expect negative answers. Who has known the mind of the Lord? No one. Who has become God's counselor? Nobody. Who has given to God that he should be repaid. Impossible. Nobody does that. What free diver today would attempt the Mariana Trench? These three questions reflect the three aspects of God's character in the first part of verse 33. Oh, the depth of the knowledge of God in verse 33. And then notice the question, who has known the mind of the Lord? Do you see the parallel? Do you see the contrast? God's knowledge is deep. Who of us could know his mind? Oh, the depth of the wisdom of God in verse 33. And then the rhetorical question, who has counseled God? God is infinitely wise. Who gives him advice? Oh, the depth of the riches of God, verse 33. And then who has ever given to God anything? As if God would pay him back. Paul quotes Isaiah 40, 13 to remind us of the infinite chasm between our knowledge and God's knowledge, between our wisdom and God's wisdom. That was a reminder in Isaiah's day that God would rescue his people from Babylonian captivity. It is a reminder in our day that that we would never choose God's plans, we would never think of his scheme, and when all seems lost, God still remains faithful. Human epistemology, or how we know what we know, is dependent epistemology. You and I are designed by God to be dependent knowers. The circle of our knowledge is a subset of the big circle of God's knowledge. In other words, there's nothing God doesn't know that you know. Do you believe that? I mean, do you you really believe that? We're so quick to be tempted to give God advice, to think that we're informing God about something he's apparently unaware of because he's not operating the universe the way we think he should. Everything we know, we know because God graciously allows us to know. And our sphere of knowledge is infinitesimally small compared to God's knowledge. The point here is that no finite creature can ever claim to have a complete read on God. 
We can never track him out. We can never trace out his ways. The obvious conclusion to that realization is that no one is God's counselor. No one can give God advice about how he should be operating. No one is qualified for that position. And the way that Paul even states that, who has been God's counselor? The word for counselor here is the word for a superior counselor giving an inferior advice. Even more shocking that man would have the audacity to put himself in that position over and against God. God has no advisory board. He has no peers. There are no cabinet meetings where God decides what he's going to do by holding consultation with his creatures. And and that's a good thing too. Because God's plan is perfect. He knows everything, he implements perfect knowledge with perfect wisdom, and he employs exact knowledge and unimpeachable wisdom unto this end that he would make himself known to undeserving creatures in the infinite goodness of giving himself to them for their joy forever and ever. Any other plan would come short of that. I don't think you want the shallow puddle of human poverty, human foolishness, human ignorance interfering with the depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God. Verses 34 and 35 are terribly humbling verses for us fallen humans. We like to think that we know a lot. Sometimes we even believe we're telling God something he doesn't know. And we love our own wisdom how easily tempted we are to tell God how he should be running things. How quickly we make God a debtor to us. God, I've done this and this and this for you. Don't you think you should return the favor? These verses emphatically point to God's independence from his creatures. No one knows the mind of God. No one advises God. No one ultimately gives to God. And this doxology that Paul sings here reflects the undoing of the rebellion of man. Listen, it's a great way to know that you actually have come under the saving gospel of Jesus Christ when your heart is ready to confess your poverty of resources, the folly of your wisdom, the ignorance of your knowledge. One scholar has said, to ascribe the depth of riches, wisdom, and knowledge to God is a reversal of human rebellion the surrender of the claim that we ourselves are wise. Listen, if you come humbly surrendered to God as a dependent creature, forgiven only by his mercy, knowing that you need everything that God provides, and you have nothing to give to him that he needs intrinsically, that is a reflection that you have been humbled, broken, and rescued by his mercy. Now look down at verse 36. For, for from him and through him and to him are all things. The glory of God here is seen in the utter dependence of everything else. God is independent. Everything else is utterly dependent. For in verse 36 is the explanation why no one gives to God, advises God, or even knows what God knows. Verse 36 is the explanation for why God's judgments and his ways are way beyond our ability to grasp. And verse 36 is the explanation for why God's knowledge and wisdom and riches are seen to be unfathomably deep. And the answer is simply this. From God are all things. Through God are all things. And to God are all things. This is God's total independence, his total freedom, and the absolute dependence of everything else upon him. This is God's glory. This is what it means for God to be God. This is his godness. From him means he is the source. Through him means he is the sustainer and means. And to him means he is the end, the aim, or the goal of all things. God will not be indebted to any creature. God cannot be domesticated by his creatures. God thinks and acts independently. He alone is truly free. He needs nothing. He gives everything. And so he alone receives all glory. When he judges, he receives all glory. When he saves, he receives all glory. From him are all things. 
He is the creator, ex nihilo, who spoke everything into existence out of nothing. Every creature on earth owes its existence to God. Every atom of the inanimate universe in the farthest reaches of space owes its existence to God. Every spiritual being in the heavenly realms owes its existence to God. Nothing exists that has not been created by him. And through him are all things. God is the sustainer and the grand actor on the stage of cosmic history. History truly is his story because he is in charge. He is sovereign. He is king. He is Lord. And everything that transpires does so according to the perfection of his complete knowledge, his perfect wisdom, and his rich goodness. He is the great means by which all things happen. If he ceased to actively sustain and direct his creation, that creation would absolutely cease to be. Through him are all things. And to him are all things. He is the great ultimate end of creation. His glory is the grand terminus of all which human history is headed. Everything redounds to his glory. God is the goal of history, the aim of all that exists. There's nothing that exists or occurs which will escape the inescapable vortex of the glory of God. His grand design in the created universe was to make his intrinsic excellence known, seen, delighted in, and he will put his own glory on display for all of eternity to the limitless thrill of all who belong to him by faith in his son. Everything is rushing, relentlessly rushing to that great end. And this from him, through him, to him, to him be the glory forever, amen, doxology, is the culmination of the mountain of sovereign mercy we've been climbing. Why does Paul sing this song? What is it that has produced this outburst of praise? It is the goodness, the kindness, the grace, the undeserved mercy of God given to sinners like you and me. How small we are and how privileged simultaneously. The great, big, infinite God has set his affections on you, Christian. And he has made promises that can never be changed. He has purposes that can never be thwarted. And they all terminate in his glory, which is for your infinite good. Could there be any better news? This is the gospel. If you don't know the gospel, if you have not surrendered to the Lord Jesus Christ, if you have not experienced forgiveness of sin, would you come to Christ and find in him everything? Access to this God, access to a transformed life and eternal riches that God has purchased for all who will simply believe. Let's pray. God, to you be all glory. To you be all glory. To you be all glory now and forever. Your mercy will be the theme of our song. Today and this afternoon and the week to come and in the years to come and in eternities to come, we will sing of your sovereign mercy because it is that which brought us to your glory in a way that we would not be destroyed by your glory, but could stand blameless with great joy in it and enjoy it. For these things, words are too small. Our expressions are too feeble. And yet you give us the great privilege of uttering them. We sing now for your glory. Amen.